Hey everybody, so we are going to be continuing the trend that I started last summer, which is reviewing books from the knowledge graph and semantics space. And the reason I do this is because so many of you ask me what books I would recommend if you are just getting started or if you want to learn more information about semantics. So that is what we're going to be doing for the whole month of June this year. And today we are going to be reviewing that book and with all of these reviews, I always give away my review copy uh, to someone in the audience. So if you are interested in that, make sure you check the description down below for more details. All right, so with that, let's go get started. Sure, uh, my name is Dean Barker. I work for a company called Optimizely. Uh, Optimizely sells a digital experience platform. Kind of the core of that would be a content management system, but it's surrounded by a bunch of other tools. There's an experimentation platform and a personalization platform and a commerce platform. Really the core of the platform would be a content management system. I'm the global director of content management here. I've been working in the CMS space for about 25 years. It's <laughs> all I've really ever done. Um, I, I haven't moved far beyond that. I manage the, our CMS from a strategic standpoint where it's gonna go over the next couple of years. And uh, yeah, CMS is pretty much what I do. So what's, what is content modeling? <laughs> So I, this is actually the second book that I wrote. The, the first book I wrote was the O'Reilly book on web content management. And in that book, uh, content modeling, I presented as kind of the base discipline of a content management system. This book was accidental. I actually didn't mean to write it. I started writing it as a blog post, all the different ways that a system can model content. Modeling content is explaining a domain of content to a system. And I'm going to give you an example. Let's say we want to make a database of press releases that our company has issued. Well, you have to do something. The idea of a database of press release is wonderful in theory. That's great. But what are you actually going to store? Well, this is when you start breaking it down. Okay, well, we're going to store the title and maybe a subtitle and maybe a body and a date it was published and the author. You start thinking about like an Excel spreadsheet. Like what are the columns, mm -hmm. right? The columns mm -hmm. you're going to store. And then also you start putting restrictions on your content because you're like, well, the date has to be a date, clearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... It probably has to be in the future or in the past, or it can't be more than a year ago. Mm -hmm. And author, is author required? Do we have to put an author? What if there is no author? You start dealing with all these questions about how to describe your data. And you do this because when your content management system has an accurate description of your data, it can do things. <laughs> it can automatically generate an editorial interface. If you tell it the date published is a date, it can give you a little date picker because it knows this now. Mm -hmm. If you tell it that title is required, it can prevent somebody from saving content with a blank title. Also, it can, can perform actions on this because you have date in there and it knows that it's a date. Well, it could give you a reverse chronologically ordered list of press releases. These are things that we call content automation. Mm -hmm. Content management is fundamentally about boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, we put boundaries around content in order to achieve greater ends. We, we require that date published be a valid date so that we can order it. And if your editor says, well, what if I don't want it to be a valid date? Well, <laughs> sorry, it's a rule and it's a rule for a reason. Yeah. We do that specifically to achieve other ends. And so that's what content modeling is. It's describing data and putting rules around data so that we can do greater, more interesting things with it. Content modeling, they don't want boundaries. Yeah rules, then they don't want to see amounts. Well, and it's interesting too, because I've made lots and lots of ontologies on the exact same stuff you're talking about, right? So the CMS like helps organize that data, you know, for very specific reasons, but those constraints, right? Those are, those are incredibly important. Ontologies also allow you to have constraints. So if you have a CMS, you probably already have some constraints to stick into your ontology if you're looking for that, right? So yeah, I mean, to be fair, I, we use content modeling because ontology is a scary word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a content model in some sense is an ontology. We're describing entities. Mm -hmm. We're setting rules and relationships around those entities. Yeah. And the reason why I wrote the book is because it's very easy to talk about content modeling in theory. It's easy to talk about ontologies in theory. Mm -hmm. When you have to apply these to a piece of software, <laughs> different CMSs, different software systems have different capabilities. Like they have different ways that you can validate content. They have different ways that you can aggregate content. There are mm -hmm. all sorts of different flavors for working with content modeling. And I've been in the CMS space for 25 years now, and I've worked with a hundred different content management <laughs> systems. And I've seen the way they all do it to the point where I will try content management systems out just to see how they do something. Yeah. I just think it's interesting. 
And I started to kind of collect those patterns in my head. And then one day I thought, well, I'm going to write a blog post. I'm going to get all these patterns out. And 20,000 words in, I was like, well, I guess this is a book now. And uh, <laughs> so what I wrote is the book, and it has 23 different criteria. It has 23 different um, explanations of how a system might provide some functionality. Like, for instance, I'm looking at the table of contents right now in another window. Uh, criteria number two, can the built-in model be extended with custom content types? Um, criteria number 12, can types, can content types be formed through inheritance or composition? Um, criteria number 15, what is the relationship between, quote, pages, end quote, and content? Things like that. How different systems do this really dictates what you're going to be able to do with it. Mm -hmm. and I think it's utterly and completely fascinating. So this is one of the great questions of, of CMS these days is the relationship between the management of content and the display or the delivery of content. Traditionally, with a web content management system, those were kind of bundled together. So when an editor was working and filling out a form with some content, they could flip over to a preview mm -hmm. and see what this is going to look like. And that was very helpful because it was kind of like in context documentation, right? Mm -hmm. The best documentation is to see what it will actually look yep. like when it comes out. Um, but now with like headless content management systems and systems that have divorced themselves from the presentation or delivery, that gets harder to do. Yeah. And so oftentimes you have editors kind of working blind. They like yeah. don't know yeah. when I type this title in, what happens to it? And when you talk about multi-channel publishing, so you're taking this content in one place and putting it in different channels, that title may work different ways yeah. in different channels. Yeah. And how can you account for all this? And this is one of the great challenges we're working through now in the world of CMS. Uh, I have a friend, Karen McGrain, who's really well known in the content strategy space. And she's often said that content or truncation is not a content strategy. And she collects examples of inopportune truncation, words that are truncated in such a way that they give an entirely different mm -hmm. meaning to the content. And so when you talk about publishing into different channels, there's a concept of what I call channel elasticity. Is how rigid is the channel? For instance, an Apple Watch, very mm -hmm. rigid channel. Um, whereas the browser is kind of the ultimate in channel elasticity. You can really fit anything in there and make yeah. anything work. On a watch, you really can't. On a display yeah. advertising in the elevator, that may be a very, very rigid channel. Or and on so your the way, refrigerator. Right, <laughs> That's a right. The way that you model content, mm -hmm. you need to account for the rigidity, the elasticity of all these different yeah. channels. And that'll really play into how you model your content because how you model your content um, very much drives what you can do with your content in the future. It is very easy to hamstrung your, your content model. Do something that you just can't fix later on. The classic example, which thank goodness you don't see too often, is people put, um, like if they're, if they're storing people, they'll put a field for name and they'll just type Dean Space Barker in there. <laughs> and then they'll be like, okay, well, I want to order these people by last name alphabetically. Well, I'm sorry, you can't. They're like, well, can we just split them on the space? Well, that works until we get to Mary Jo mm -hmm. and then it doesn't work anymore. And so like the most basic concept is first name and last name have to be different fields. Yep, yep, and yep. It, and it, I've seen, and, and even that first name, last name is not the same geographically speaking, No. right? So I, I've had a lot of folks in the publishing space, right? Like you have... Um, names that the first name is like the surname of their family and the the last name is actually their, the name that they would go by, um, you know, just talking to someone. And, you know, if you don't know that going in, your content model is going to be a little wonky depending on who puts what in. Um, there's, there's countries in Africa, I believe Ethiopia, it's very common just to have one name. Mm. You don't have a surname. So this gets into validation rules. So I'm creating mm -hmm. my content model. I have a first name and a last name. I've gotten that far. Well, I'm going to require both of those. Everybody has to have a first name or a last name until they don't. Yep. And so the question you have to have is, is we start dealing with use cases. Like, is it a valid use case that you will ever store someone in here who doesn't have a last name? The answer to that might be no. And you might require the last name because that's a boundary that you're willing to abide by and put in there. I, my wife, um, my wife does not have a middle name. Mm -hmm. uh, she never had a middle name. And when we first started dating, I would get emails. She would email me from work and it would come through as Annie N and then her last name. <laughs> and I said to her once, I'm like, I thought you didn't have a last name. And she goes, I don't. And I said, N is your last name, the email system. So she went and looked into human resources and it turns out they had to put N something in the middle name. So they put, no, they put N-M-N, -N, no middle name. 
That's what they put in there. And because they had to put something, it was a rule. Yeah. And they didn't have anyone else at the company that didn't have a middle name. And uh, so this is the concept of content modeling. It's yeah. being aware of the content that you're delivering. Yeah. How well, and, and the that? exceptions to the rules and how to, to address those. Like we have the same problem in the ontology space. Like, you know, um, you know, talking about uh, names and specifically dates, a date, right? There's, there's whole libraries on how to format dates. Like there's so many different ways to format a date until you maybe are dealing with historical data and true story, year of the cherry blossom. What is that? Like that's how do I trans, day, right? And that's where blossom. some like ETL stuff maybe is also happening where how do you translate that into a true date form according to the rules that you're following? Or, you know, um, this was a very bad rule that I saw in a content management system once, which was if a language for this content is not specified, it is English. So <laughs> that's not that's not uncommon. I know, but it's not good most, either. <laughs> most content management systems will have a default language, and it's often specified that if this is kind of the fallback default language. But your thing about the year of the cherry blossom is really interesting. First of all, never heard of that before. That's a wild <laughs> one. But what you're talking about is transitioning something from one model to another. So the source that that content was in, the year of the tra cherry blossom was valid. Well, if you're taking that content out and putting it into a different content model, you're now exposing it to a different set of rules. Yes. And this is what we find during content migrations yeah. all the time. I mean, it just date formatting is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, like there's just content. They're like, well, we want to make a subtitle required. Okay. Well, you have a thousand articles that are coming in without mm -hmm. a subtitle. So what do you plan to do about yeah. that? It's about putting rules around it and exception handling. Yeah. Like, what do you do when there's an exception? Yeah. Um, and so there's, content modeling, it's about describing your data and putting rules around it. Well, and, and there's, there's debates, right? Like there's no one way to correctly model something. Like somebody could argue on that, of course, but you know, I, I spent one time in my life, uh, six whole months arguing a lot with some folks on whether, uh, athlete was a, uh, human type, a type of human is an athlete, or is it a role? Athlete or I'm, role? Yeah, is it a role? So, um, you know, Tiger Woods, he's a father, he's a dad, he's an athlete, he's a spokesperson, like those are all roles that he plays. Um, but could you consider him as a human, as a, a type of human that is an athlete? Yes, you can do it that way too. So, you know, at the end of the day, you have to go back to your use cases, right? Like, what are you using this data for? Do you really need to model the entity that is Tiger Woods, who is, you know, maybe on a bunch of pamphlets that you you have created for your, because he's a spokesperson for you, like your subway or something. Um, do you need to say he's an athlete or do you need to say he's human? Because, you know, maybe you have animal mascots and other things. <laughs> like, it's, it's these kind of things you got to talk about when you're doing your modeling to understand what makes sense. So there's a term called MRU, minimum reusable unit, which is like, how small do you break your content down to? The example, I'm just looking at my first book here. The example I used is an address. So 123 Main Street, Suite 1, New York, New York, 10001. So that is address one, address two, city, state, zip. That's good for most situations. But then what if we're doing 123 Main Street South, Suite 200, Mail Stop 456, Care of Bob Johnson, New York, New York, 10001-0001, APO, AP12345-1234. <laughs> so it goes back to the use case because the, the latter version I used, if you're the post office, you probably need to model at that level. Yes. You probably need to model the street number as a separate field because that tells you what side of the street a house is on and that's important to you as the post office mm -hmm. for everyone else not so much it goes yeah. back to your use case now everyone's like okay well let's model as detailed as possible just so we cover all our bases no because you will drive your editors insane yeah. the more detailed your model is yes technically you've increased your flexibility you future proof your content but your editors hate working with it now because there's 8 billion fields and they don't know what's yeah, what. Yeah, so then then they'll they'll try to shortcut it as much as possible. I mean, you have to walk, you have to walk a balance, right? So I'm always the person thinking, okay, well, eventually 
we would want to know, um, I, I, what, what was, uh, like the territory something is in, or for some, some reason that we, we really wanted something like that or the continent or something that something was on. Did we need it in that moment? Is that too detailed? Yeah. But again, like you have to walk a balance. Like there's like going so far deep that you're like talking about something at the molecule level, which is not needed. Or can you think to yourself, you know, uh, I know the needs of my content and my product and my customers and the people who make the, the, the content itself. Would they ever want to have um, analytics on on this data to see, you know, how much how many how much content is produced from one continent to another? Conceivably, yes. But I think this is where you have to think about, can it be extended, right? This is why relational databases aren't as good as, as graph databases in this specific instance, because with a graph database, you can say, okay, um, somebody has this, this address and you can see that it is a state and a city that is in the United States. You can easily look that up. Okay, then you can add data later on if you need it to say that information can be rolled up to it's in the, in the United States. Or do you need to roll it even farther down where you can see that state and that city and therefore you can look up the county, right? So as long as I think you have like the points, like the accordion where you can like expand it or contract it as needed, I think that's kind of like the, the sweet spot on that. Yeah, the bottom line is it's a balance between flexibility and simplicity and editor friendliness. Yeah. My friend Greg Dunlap has just released a book on designing the editorial experience, which not enough people pay attention mm -hmm. to. When it comes to content modeling, we don't pay attention to what our editors will need to work with and what makes yeah. sense to our editors. Because in our business, we're obsessed with customer experience, which we should be for sure. We kind of just think our editors will figure it out. So mm -hmm. we don't do things to make our editors' yeah. lives better. I maintain the number one reason. I have done a lot of CMS selection work, consulted on picking mm -hmm. CMS. The number one reason people want a new CMS is their editors hate it. Mm -hmm. We can't stand it. We can't stand working with it. And I keep looking at their situation. And I'm like, if someone put, you know, 10,000 extra dollars into designing that editorial interface better, you might save a quarter million dollars on yeah. buying a new CMS. Yeah. Um, so we just, we don't put this, take this into account. And we need to take that into account in our content modeling and designing our interfaces. And we need to pay attention to our editors more, I think. Yeah. And, and I would say even taxonomy editors too. I, I actually see that a lot in text, not as much on the ontology side, for some reason, because ontologies are easier to logic check visually, like there's usually some more visual components like addressed in it. But there are so many taxonomy management systems where taxonomy editors that are going in and maintaining the taxonomy and then using it to then index content, right? There, there, it's a piece of content modeling. It's so bad. There was actually a very prominent, won't mention their name because they're still a big name out there um, that does taxonomy management. And I had been looking at that as a taxonomy manager back in the day. And the reason we didn't go with it is because the, the, the taxonomist editors that we were reviewing the tool with hated the color scheme so bad that it literally was giving them headaches. Wow. Because it was the company's colors. And when we asked the simple question, like, can we, can we modify this? Can we make it like dark mode? Cause like people are staring at the screen a lot, you know, it's hard on their eyes. No, they can't. So we went with a different tool. <laughs> Content models and software have one thing in common. The most sophisticated model or tool is worthless if no one uses it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's very and true. That's why people stick with low tech stuff that they know works because it's easy to get their head around and they know that it works and it's simple and they're used to it. Yeah. Um, and then people are like, well, I built this better thing. Why don't people use this? Well, because they hate working with it and that matters. <laughs>